will just uh, give some few minutes for more members to join in. Maybe in uh, like uh, a minute or so, we'll start the talk. We're still continuing uh, to admit more participants. Welcome. So good afternoon, everyone. I think uh, it's a high time that uh, we start our talk for today. Uh, thank you very much, each and everyone, for creating time to join us uh, this lovely afternoon. It's quite uh, gloomy here in uh, in Nairobi, but all in all, all is well. So uh, today, our talk is about a healthy city, urban trees in Nairobi, which will be presented by. Uh, Catherine Watson. So I uh, welcome each and every one of you. For invited guests, we are also uh, inviting you to join our membership. We'll be sharing uh, uh, how to go about that in the chat box uh, as the presentation goes on. So just um, a, a quick one. I will uh, take you through a short brief of uh, Catherine's uh, bio, and then I will um, welcome her to the floor to take us through the presentation. Uh, Kathy Watson is uh, Chief of Partnerships at C4 Aircraft, where she has worked since 2012. Before moving to Nairobi, she lived in Uganda for 25 years from where she reported from the PPC, Guardian, and other outlets, and founded two NGOs, Straight Talk Foundation and Mbule Trust. She is an Ashoka Fellow with an undergraduate degree in biology from Princeton, and a graduate certificate in agroforestry from the University of Missouri. She is passionate about youth, trees, and biodiversity, especially in East Africa. That's a short and uh, brief bio about uh, Catherine Watson. My name is Richard Kipneno, the membership and budding officer at Nature Kenya. And uh, over to you, Catherine, you take us through the talk. Karibu. Okay, thanks very much. Really glad you're all here today. Uh, let me just close this the chat thing and I'll also drop uh, the, the, the faces down so I can see the screen. So this is what I'm gonna be talking about, a healthy city, urban trees in Nairobi. And for those of you who don't recognize, the picture on the right is Machuki Park, which was renovated um, just very recently. And that's the central business district right there. And that's their nursery. And on your left, you'll see a picture of the road that I've been working on with my community in uh, sort of Northwest Nairobi running from uh, Waiaki Way to uh, uh, Red Hill Road uh, towards Geshe. And what's happening in that picture is you can see those trees that uh, are standing there. We've planted um, very, very many trees and that species there is called Brachialina, um, which is a tree that's very much treasured for 
in East Africa for, for carvings and it's threatened and it's done very well in the bypass. And the people you see in the picture are from Spring Valley Coffee, which is a coffee shop you may know, and they're putting in seed bowls provided by um, Teddy Kinanjui, the, the seed bowl uh, guru in town here. So I'd like to start. Uh, that's just a, you know some, some good first pictures to get us going. Okay, let me just, yeah, whoops. Okay, so it's a very exciting time globally for the urban forest. And the question then arises, what is the urban forest? And there are some very good urban forestry and peri-urban forestry guidelines that were published by the UN Food and Agricultural Organization in 2016. You can get them online. And they define urban forest as the system of all woodland, groups of trees, and individual trees in urban and peri-urban areas. And those include forest, like Karura, street trees, like what you have downtown, trees in parks and gardens, uh, and trees in derelict corners, right? Um, like wasteland or something. And the urban forest is the backbone of the green infrastructure and it bridges rural and urban areas and it ameliorates or it improves a city's environmental footprint. Oops, hold on, let me just click on it and just, okay. There we go. So it's exciting for urban forests right now because finally they're really getting full on recognition of their importance because of the climate crisis and because of COVID. And this picture is from Com Green, which is a fantastic group working in Corrigocho. And um, these are, we, we did some tree planting there and you can see the, the small children that walking them into this informal settlement along Nairobi River. But World Health Organization has a, a sentence that they say about urban forests that I really like, which is that few, if any, other public health intervention can deliver the positive health and social outcomes that green space in cities can. So if you wanna do a public health intervention and you want to hit a lot of different buttons, one of the best things you can do is create green your city. Um, you get heightened, people get heightened immune function in a greener city. They get less respiratory disease. They're less lonely because they go outside and socialize more. There's even less crime and tree cover has even been linked, urban tree cover has even been linked to better school attainment, uh, getting better marks in class. So the other great thing about this time is that trees are finally getting really recognition as a place for families and a place you can do more physical activity. And this was a family on the left that I took a picture of. It was the very first day that Machuki Park was opened you know, that's 24 hectares down near Boulevard Hotel, Museum of Kenya, that area down there that had fallen into crime and um, it had become a hideout and it had, was very derelict, right? And then it's now been rehabilitated and it's now safe to go to. But this family, this father had brought all three of his sons there on the first day and they were so, so happy. And just because I want to get you guys really up to speed on trees, that tree that's been planted there is something called a Trichilia emetica. There's a lot of them downtown and we've planted them on the bypass as well. And then the lady on the right was some, I stopped people in Karura Forest during the COVID period. I was doing a bit of research and a lot of them said to me that their doctors had told them to, to go to Karura. You know, they were pre-diabetic uh, the doc and, and that once they started exercising in Karura, a lot of their health problems resolved. And then I asked this Karura forest scout called Peter Kamau, and he said, yeah, many are diabetic or have high blood pressure and they've been advised to exercise. They really value the forest. So that's more recognition of, of urban green space. Sorry, let me just have to click on this to make it go. Okay, yeah. So there's also a lot of recognition now that urban trees can provide nutrition. That's the concept of urban agriculture and as well as medicine. So this gentle young man here, you can see looking at this pawpaw is again with that group of, of um, what they call, they call themselves reformed gang members. 
um, down in Corrigocho, and they're doing a lot of urban agriculture. Uh, and that is going to provide that papaya there is going to or popo is going to provide a lot of nutrition to people there. But also you can see in the city, and, and I want you to look closely at these this tree trunk. This is a tree called Xanthoxylum galetti. And if you look really closely, carefully and you've got good eyes, you can see it's got spines on it. And that's very typical of it. And it's called Muchagatha and Shikuma in Kikuyu and Luya. But if you can see, people have been debarking it. And this is just near the bypass. And I suddenly realized that this tree was being used for medicinal person purposes. And then one day I saw a gentleman with a knife actually uh, peeling the tree. And I got out of the car and I explained that, it, you know, I wasn't bothered that he was doing this. I was just very interested in what, why he was doing it. And he said, it's very good for flu. It tastes like menthol. Um, but actually the tree is being killed and he knew that. Um, and this is because it's not, they're not just taking the bark. They're actually going deep inside to the living part, the cambrium. Um, but we have planted quite a few of these trees on the bypass, but it just goes to show that people who live in the city have a lot of knowledge about the medicine, the medicinal value of these trees. So urban, the urban space is all green space is also now being, um, well, there's somebody who wants to be admitted. Let me just admit that person. Okay, I can see it there. So the urban space is also being recognized as very important for disaster risk reduction. And we don't think about this very much, right? But tree leaves in a city intercept water, they slow it down, they keep it, they drip it slowly so you get less flooding, yeah. They recharge the water in the ground, the, in the groundwater because the roots force the water downwards. And so you get better groundwater recharge. So you get less floods and more groundwater recharge. And I think many of you know that the boreholes in the city often dry up. And I went to interview um, the, the National uh, Water and Sewage Company, the chief engineer there. And she said, yeah, in Nairobi, our underground rivers have dried up. And then when there's, when there's heavy rain, the water just runs around and has nowhere to go and it can't sink down. Um, so trees are very, very important for slowing and spreading and sinking water. Okay, so urban forests are having a moment, right? They're getting their due, they're getting their due recognition. And very, very nicely, we've had a bunch of articles that have just come out about forest, urban forestry in East Africa. The one on the left, actually both of these articles are in a magazine called Miti, Miti which of course means tree in Swahili. And I've actually put the email down there and the phone number because uh, it's, they, they don't have an online version. So you need to get hold of it. Um, and those are some of the contacts you can use. But if you don't have time to write it down now, you can just Google Meaty Magazine, right? But this is a terrific issue because it's got uh, uh, articles about um, trees in, in City Park. It's got an article by me on the bypass I'm gonna tell you about. It's got articles on Kampala. Um, it's in Moshi, I think there's one on Bagamoyo. So it's, it's really, really exciting. And then this, these are the articles that I wrote. Uh, this is the bypass you're gonna be looking at here, but uh, there's a nice article there about how we did the bypass. It was also in Swara. So if you just do Kathy Watts in Swara, Nature Nairobi, you'll get the article as well. And so this was the very beginning of the bypass here where, and you can see a Meru Oak, that was maybe like four months into us working on it. And it's not just Nairobi where trees are suddenly being considered as important. Uh, there's a very charismatic mayor called Mayor Aki Sayer, who is the mayor of uh, Freetown, which is the capital of Sierra Leone. And she has this whole thing about Freetown, the tree town, and she's planting a million trees uh, to prevent flooding and to promote well-being. And some of you may remember in 2017, there was this terrible landslide into uh, on the edges of Freetown, and that's part of the catalyst for wanting to address things. Um, and Kampala, it doesn't look so great right here, but there's, they're, they're transitioning part of the downtown into uh, pedestrian only. So many African cities are really thinking about their urban forests now. And uh, I just want to talk about something. Uh, I lived in Kampala for many years, so I follow it very, very closely, right? Kampala does not have 
Machuki Park, uh, City Park, uh, Karura. It wasn't designed in the same way. The green space is uh, much, much poorer than in Nairobi, but it's setting the pace for how we now need to be working on trees and cities. And I wanna give it a shout. Um, they've developed an urban forest management plan. They've got 10 young foresters working for Kampala City Capital Authority. And they did so interestingly, they did a tree census and they worked out there, there's 328 different species of tree in the city, but 80% of the species were exotic and 71% of the individual trees were exotic. And avocado was the most, oh yeah, typo. Avocado is the most common tree. And they know what their tree cover is. Whereas I don't think in Nairobi, we actually know what our tree cover is. I've heard 10%, but of course it would take, you know, if you counted all of Karura forests, that would raise it, right? But you've also got areas that are completely without trees, pretty much on um, the informal settlements, right? So they, they do know their tree cover and they want, it's 13% and they want to get to the magic number of 30%, which is what a lot of cities around the world are trying to aim for now. And places like um, New York City and London are at 21% um, tree cover. They even know how much carbon is being sequestered by the trees. They've geotagged their trees. And I think it would be absolutely fantastic if we could do something similar in Nairobi. Um, I think uh, um, that would be great. So the Nairobi story, uh, I think we all know it. Most of the people on this um, uh, probably who are listening are Kenyans and live in Nairobi. So we know that in recent, uh, the last year or so, it's been a story of trees lost, you know, along Uhuru Highway. I took this photograph down near the playing grounds of the university there. Uh, and they didn't, the guys who were cutting the trees definitely didn't like the fact that I was taking a photograph. It was unfortunate, you know, they're widening the, the road. Um, but there's also the famous story of the fig tree, the ficus here in Westlands, which was saved. Um, and then, so we've had its trees lost, we've had a tree saved. But I also want to say that the city has a huge capacity to absorb more trees. And this is a very good example. This is in Gong Road, I believe. Um, and look at that wonderful area in the middle where you could plant a line of really, really good trees. And I'll be explaining what I think are good trees in a little bit. Um, so, okay, we lost a lot this year, but I think we can plant back better, right? We can do even better trees than the ones we lost, yeah? And I think jacaranda, grevillea, eucalyptus, they're a thing of the past. We don't want them in the city really anymore. They, they wouldn't be, we shouldn't cut them, but they wouldn't be our first choice of something to plant now, right? That's kind of old fashioned thinking. Grevillea and eucalyptus are both Australian trees. Uh, they're very useful economic trees they're not really what you want for a city. They don't tick the boxes of what you want for a city, right? And jacaranda is, I know many people think it's an African tree, but it's actually uh, a Brazilian tree. And as this morning goes on, this, this talk goes on, I'm gonna tell you that I know the color is really beautiful when it flowers, but there are some indigenous trees that flower with the same intensity and an equally beautiful purple. So what I suggest we do is that we build on Kenya's rich biodiversity for resilience to climate shocks that are already here and are still to come. I think we need to plant to respond to human needs. We need to bolster biodiversity. And I think uh, in many ways, um, Nairobi is perfectly situated to do this well. You've got rich knowledge from botanists, entomologists and people like that at the museums of Kenya, plus several very good universities. We can create green jobs for youth and we, can, we need to create a cadre of arborists because we don't really have people who know how to, have been scientifically trained in removing a branch in tree care, right? It's different from being a forester. And just quickly to get you up, get, get you up to speed on species if, and plants if you don't know, that's a Dombea, one of the Dombea species. And you can see it's got a lovely uh, pink flower. And that's the, um, that's the nursery at Karura Forest, which is always also, it's the Friends of Karura Nursery. The KFS also has a very, very good nursery. 
Okay, hold on a second, sorry. Yeah, so when I was going around Kampala with the young foresters, they said every tiny place, every tiny space we want to plant, right? Whether it's grass, we plant grass, whether it's a room for a tree, we plant trees. And I think that's a really good way to think about it. But I also wanted to say that already there's some very good planting going on in Nairobi. And this is not a very good picture, but this is Junction Mall. And even Sarat Center has got some, the new areas of Sarat Center has got some really good tree planting. So this is uh, in Zambarao, the tree on the left, which uh, the Swahili speakers will know is a, a small purple fruit that is very popular. It's actually, it, it, Zizigium kumunai is actually the Indian version of uh, this tree, and that's what you call in Zambarao. But there's another one called Zizigium guinensis, like Guinea, like the West African um, uh, um, country. And we've planted both of those on, on the bypass. So you, here in Junction, you can see they've got um, in Zambarao, that's a very nice thing to plant. It's good for, the, for birds as well. And then where you can see that human being there on the lower right-hand corner, actually inside there, they've planted some albizias that are indigenous. And this gentleman here is somebody called John Ora, who was the chief forester for Karura for a long time. And he's, they've, he's done some very excellent planting in Mithega. And he's standing there with, um, with um, a Wabergia tree. Um, so when you plant trees in cities, you don't want to have just one type of tree because you, what you could do is you could have a catastrophic loss of tree canopy if an insect, for example, a pest took over that uh, tree species, right? So what you really need is to follow this rule, which was developed by American foresters in the 90s called the 10, 20, 30 rule, right? And you don't want to have too many of one species. You don't want more than 10% of one species, 20% of one genus, or 30% of one family, right? You want to have different ones because pests tend to feed on similar types of trees. So if you all had very closely related trees or even worse, one species of tree, you'd be very, very uh, um, prone to catastrophic um, canopy loss. So then there's another rule, that's the 10, 20, 30 rule. These are the forestry rules. Then there's another one called the 3, 30, 300 rule. And it's just been, uh, promoted this year by a professor called Cecil, um, who's at the University of British Columbia. And he thinks everybody should be able to see three trees from their home. There should be 30% tree canopy in every neighborhood, and no one should live further than 300 meters from the nearest park or green space, right? And just that's just a nice, like, um, uh, sort of rule of thumb, right, when you're thinking about things. Um, and you know, it's ironic that more affluent people are the ones who live near Karura, right? And actually it'd be very good if, if Karura was in a different part of the city where people who don't have so many trees get access. There's a lot of what they call tree inequality in Nairobi with some areas having very little tree cover and other areas having much more. Anyway, this is our roundabout um, quite recently. We, we're really proud of this roundabout. This is, this is our restoration. This was completely bare earth. Um, in December, um, in January 2020, and we've got it going again. And some people have even, and this is very touching for me, have even gone there to take um, wedding photographs. Okay, another urban forestry principle is plant, plant um, leaves with trees with large leaves, right? So my colleague in Violata's hand is placed on top of a Cordia africana leaf. And then that's um, a ficus leaf, the fig leaf of one of the large leaved ficuses. Because when you maximize leaf surface, leaf surface, it can help to reduce storm water volumes and it actually protects the road itself, right? So when people just say, oh, you just want to plant trees everywhere and why are you planting trees along this road? Say to them, the trees are actually going to protect the gray infrastructure. And this in fact is, um, in Uganda, where they've done a big road from Entebbe to Kampala. And I personally think the planting is really bad. And, you know, they've got these lovely green spaces where they could be planting great book mavule trees and hardwoods, and they've planted eucalyptuses and coconut palms, which I think is a terrible waste of uh, a great opportunity. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about um, 
uh, the Waiaki Way Gishie Link Road, what I call the bypass. Uh, they opened it in about May 2019, and everybody was really happy because it, um, you know, it shortened commuting times. But it was left completely, completely bare. Um, not nothing was planted, right? And not only that, uh, there was a lot of rubble, uh, which wasn't nice. But uh, lots of groups along the highway really wanted to do something, and I had my own little group. And our thinking was, with climate crisis and biodiversity collapse every space is an opportunity to capture carbon, uh, create habitat, help groundwater. And, you know, I was also thinking, what if you building an urban forest along this highway could make a contribution to Nairobi's 10, 2030 and 3, 30, 300, and even be a mini arboretum. And this really outer space looking kind of um, flower here is on a Kenyan tree called Rathmania. And we've planted one of those along the bypass, and I'd love to get a few more in. They're not very easy to get, but, you know, it's an innocuous small tree, but, you know, it's rare and it's so great for biodiversity. And then here on the left, you can see just how big the challenge was for us to get the green back. It was all brown. So we, we, did, we didn't just do it like gorilla planting. Uh, that is um, gorilla as in like um, a gorilla group, right? Um, not the mountain gorillas. Uh, and gorilla planting is when you go into a city and you pop plants in little corners and you don't really have permission. It's also a fun sort of thing. But we did go to see Kura, Kenya Urban Roads Authority, and they gave us permission to plant, right? We also had a very, very interesting conversation with them because the traditional thinking about road planting has been that it's beautification and it's landscaping, right? And we came, I went with my colleagues, you can see Dr. Catherine Mathuri there, um, uh, and um, she's a colleague of mine at ICRAF, she's a professor. And, you know, our interest was creating a green corridor for biodiversity and was all these things I've been talking about, carbon, stormwater uh, management, uh, a place for people, right? And actually they, I think, so the, we were a little bit talking at cross purposes, although we were really enjoying ourselves, as you can see. And then there was a lot of discussion about what tree, and a typical thing that people have liked to plant is the cheapest tree, right? And casarinas, which you see at the coast in Kenya, it's like a pine tree with long, long, long needles. It's actually an Australian evergreen. Uh, that was one suggestion, just to do casarinas all the way up. And you know, we said very, very nicely, oh no, you know, we really want to do something different. And, and they were great about it. Another one you see a lot is this one called Thevetia Peruviana, which is a small yellow flowering tree. And actually all parts of it are toxic and it's from Peru. So it's kind of a waste of space. Um, uh, you know, and we wanted to do indigenous ones. Sorry, I'm having trouble. Yeah, there we go. So one way we thought about what to plant was what was the natural vegetation that was there before. And so we know this area because we are kind of up near Karura, right? We know this area until it was cleared for coffee by uh, settlers was, uh, it, or and it still is if you look at uh, Karura, it's, it's categorized as tropical dry upland montane forest. And there's a huge amount of information about what trees that consists of. And um, this, this bit here on the left is with the roundabout, that's kind of the stretch that we've been doing. And you can see it's also uh, sort of surrounded by um, uh, what was farmland and hasn't all been be built up yet. And then we have the kind of Nairobi levels of, of rain a year, and it's, we're also pretty high. So this is what it looked like in December, 2019. And it was completely bare. That's the up, upper left-hand corner is the roundabout where I said they've been having uh, weddings. Um, Wedding, recept, uh, wedding photographs taken. It was just, this is actually looking slightly better than when we first found it because we had already um, tidied up the earth, smoothed it down, taken out rubble. Um, so we started to plant. It was really a bad time to plant because you, December is actually when the rains are totally stopping. So we lost all the grass, but we were learning. Um, and then in January, we started again. You can see the ground's a bit wet, but you can also see that gullies were forming here in the second picture. And so we, with this team of people I assembled, 
um, we decided we were going to just tidy it all up, remove all the rubble, and we were going to mulch the whole thing. And there's a lot of um, plants that grow around in those fields that are actually pretty much like invasive species. But they're also, some of them are quite good. Tithonia has got quite a lot of uh, nutrients in it. So the team just chopped, 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 and we covered everything with mulch because we realized that it wasn't just about planting trees. We had to do something to take care of the soil. And then down here on the lower bit, you can see John Orwa, the tall imposing person in blue. And he's actually pacing out five meters, five meters, five meters, because we were about to start planting. And so on January 21st, we planted about 120 trees all running along. And these are all the species. And we were really chuffed about what trees we've been able to find in the nurseries around. Um, and you'll recognize coton, crotons, cordia, teclea, which is, a, there's a lot of that in, um, in um, Corura marcamia, which is the yellow flowering tree that is kind of like, it could be used as, a, as a, like a eucalyptus it, and it also does good poles. It's, it's a fast growing sort of tree. Then Newtonia, lovely spreading, Prunus africana, the medicinal one, Nandi flame, which you all know, then the elgum olive, and then uh, marrow oak, then the albizias, trichilia, which I showed you before, and then two other ones. So we really, really worked on the soil and we didn't just rush to plant. And we had a plan, sort of, but we also just went for it. And we just, I was very against planting anything exotic, um, but you know, hibiscus is exotic, right? And after a while, it became so difficult to find indigenous shrubs um, that I thought, why not have hibiscus is? And we were visited by a pollinator expert uh, Dr. Wanja Kanuthia from Museums of Kenya. And she said pollinators will visit um, hibiscuses. So I sort of thought, okay, that's fine, right? And, um, and that, the red flower down in the lower left-hand corner is something called Kleine, Kleinia abyssinica and is an indigenous flower that you can buy. And then this tall tree down here, and you can see we're running down to, towards Kitasuru there, if you know the area. We planted some really big ficuses, fig trees, real mugumos there. Um, because um, it's very far from the road, like, you know, maybe 10 meters or something, no chance the roots could disturb the road and where we wanted, where you, we could plant big trees, we wanted to plant big trees. So uh, we are all about grass. It was the most expensive thing we did. You, you know how grass is done vegetatively, piece by piece by piece, but it was so completely worth it and it grew very, very, very fast. So this is four months into us starting to work on it. And we really began to um, see, see progress. So this is the same place I've just showed you where we had mulched and where John Orwell was pacing. And you can see how nice it quickly got. Uh, and it was really exciting. And I really recommend to anybody who's doing this kind of thing, do a lot of photographs. Every time you go there, do photographs, because then you can do before and after pictures. And if you're really clever, there's a way you can use your phone and you can orient it exactly the same. So, because I never quite got the picture, you replicated the, the before with the after or the after with the before. Okay. So one of the things I found very delightful and really exciting was very, very quickly, we began to see tree frogs, right? And this was just such a blast. And because the trees are only like chest high and you're actually looking on top of the leaves, we very, very quickly began to spot them and we got lots of different tree frogs. And for any people in the audience who know tree frogs, uh, one of the groups is called Hyperolius. And I think some of these are Hyperolius trees. So the one on the left is on a cordia, uh, on a cordia tree. Um, I think this one is a Vitex and then this right one here is a Marcamia, the three different, three different species. And we did have a lot of really complicated social issues, not a lot. Uh, it was very peaceful working on the bypass. Um, you know, I didn't know if it was, you know, they might, somebody might take my phone or something like that. But what's been so fantastic is people have just stopped and said to the team, um, thank you so much for what you're doing. This is really great. And sadly, a lot of young men also said, please can I have a job, right? And unfortunately we couldn't take on any more. We were four, I had a team of four women and myself. 
Um, the one complex social issue we did have was herders, Maasai herders would bring, had brought the cows there quite a number of times and uh, looking for pasture. And, you know, we said, look, we really understand your situation, but please be careful of the trees. They said, no, we just want the grass. And I said, you know, we actually planted the grass too. And they were, they were really good about it. We did lose some trees, but, you know, again, we get to plant back better because some of the trees I planted in the beginning, like you don't need so many more cameos. More cameos are kind of like a everywhere tree, right? So now I have, I know a bit more about trees than I did in January, 2020. And I'm going to be able to get even better species in there. And the opportunity cost of losing one small seedling was not a whole lot. And there's a wetland nearby here. And actually, mostly the cattle was en route to the wetland when they would be stepping on our trees. Uh, the road is really, really steep uh, in India or in uh, a northern country like Germany or something like that. They use uh, in India, they use this coconut matting. And that would have been very cool if we could have afforded and got hold of coconut matting, we could have planted through the um, through it and, and got onto the slopes because it's really, really, really steep. And you can see it in the bottom left hand picture how much earth is going onto the sidewalk. So what we ended up doing is we made this funny little fence and then we kind of put a trash line behind it, you know, with like sticks and stuff like that. And it has pretty much um, it has pretty much uh, held. Uh, earth and now uh, grass is coming down from the top and we've also planted more on the slopes but if that was a big challenge um, hold on let me just make this yeah so we've learned a lot about trees like Corda africana grows so fast has these lovely lovely flowers that are covered in bees it's very good for mulch but it its growing point does not like um it has trouble choosing its growing point so you get it's called apical dominance is the technical term for it. So you get branches going off at all angles and it's really been a challenge to prune, um, but you know, it's great. Um, and our fastest growing tree species is meru oak, which is Vitex kenyensis. Um, and that's in Bialata who has been leading the team. And that tree is like 10 months old and you can see how big it is. And what we like to say about that tree is it really knows how to be a tree. Like it has like a trunk and a crown and it looks really good early on. Um, so that's a tree I would totally, totally recommend if you're looking for a species to plant in the city. And so this is the bypass today. This is now looking down towards Kitisuru and the community in Kitisuru also planted a lot of trees. They planted more like a park. Um, you can see there on the left, but we still have our challenges with slopes and it's still an evolving um, landscape. And we're very, very proud that it's become a site for court responsibility, social responsibility, the Spring Valley Coffee. They came to do the seed bowls and now they want to, um, these are their baristas, their young staff. Um, and now they want to come once a month to pick up garbage because uh, there's a lot of drunk driving as there are in all countries, but it actually happens here as well because we find a lot of beer bottles, uh, uh, but particularly vodka bottles on, on the road, but also masks and all that kind of stuff. So they're gonna come and collect for us, which is fun. And there's really some very, we're really excited about the plant diversity. And since this is Nature Kenya, I'm not gonna hold back. This one on the left is a tree called Rawolfia kafra. Uh, I first saw it in the Mara. It has a matunda, a fruit that people in the Mara like to eat, but it's a big, dark green leafed, uh, big, nice tree. And then in the middle there, the first tree is something called a Polycius fulva or a Polycius picuensis. And you would recognize it because it has uh, a trunk and then everything goes out like a V from one point. I can't, I'm not describing it very well. And then the one behind it is called some is called Taberna Montana Statfiensis. And that's a tree you see in the forest in Kenya with a big green leafy, uh, glossy leaf. And then on the right here is a very happy uh, tree called Bridelia micrantha. Um, so we've really got the biodiversity in here, probably about 40 or 50 different species of tree. Uh, I really need to do an, actually pay somebody to do an inventory for me. Um, and we've got a strong avenues of trees. So these trees where you can see me walking with the Inviolata, 
these trees were only planted last May, right? Not this May, May 2020. So they're like 14 months old, but you can see already we've got such a good line of trees. And we also did all this grass, which is really nice. And then on the right here, you can see somebody donated, somebody called Mark Nicholson gave us some indigenous wildflowers. And this is a, a very nice, very attractive um, beef, very attractive for bees um, uh, called Asalvia. Okay, hold on, there's somebody wanting to come in. I hope I'm okay that I'm admitting these people. Um, so people get sad when you say you can't, don't plant any more jacaranda. We've done it with jacaranda. It's a kind of a colonial tree, don't need it anymore. And I just want to say, and they say, oh, the color is so beautiful, but this is uh, actually, it's called Melissa. There's six different species of this tree in Kenya called Melissa, uh, Melissa there. But I, I gathered up the flowers and put them on the ground and you can see the color is just as nice as a jacaranda. It's an indigenous tree. There's also Cape chestnut, which has a, an amazing pink purplish uh, lavenderish uh, mauve kind of colored one. So Kenya has what it needs in terms of indigenous trees. And then we also planted aloes um, and uh, because they're great for bees and they're very hardy. And this is the place, this is what makes me happiest about the bypass is when I see people sitting under the trees. And this is a lady, a security guard who's just resting. And this is a tree that a lot of people like to sit under. So we feel really happy that we've been able to create a space for people that they enjoy. And um, thanks very much. And um, I think that's enough. <laughs> thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Kathleen, for that uh, insightful uh, presentation all about uh, the efforts that you've really put in uh, greening our city. Uh, so a quick uh, sneak to the chat box. I see uh, some uh, good reactions in there. So we'll go uh, one by one. Just a moment. OK. I will start with um, one from uh, Joshua Mutunga. Uh -huh. uh, he says, great time to have this type of talk. Thank you, Kathy. What is the perception or reception of Kenha Kura on tree planting along the roads? Any active involvement from them? Um, besides letting us um, do it, they've, they've not come to see what we've done. And um, we've been super, super responsible. So we'd really like them to come and look. Like one of the things, Joshua, about planting on roads is you mustn't block visibility of drivers. So we've been very, there's lots of rules. And of course, we just looked at them on the internet, right? But if you're like, if you're coming down and you're joining a road and you've got a tree on your right, that could block your view. So we were really careful, like not to plant trees near where roads joined the bypass. Um, so we'd really, I think they'd be happy if they could see what we did, but I have to say no, no um, um, interference in the sense of negative things. They didn't say don't do anything, but they also haven't come and we were really, really looking forward to hosting them there. And it's not just like my section, there's the Kitisuru section, there's the Spring Valley section, the Nyari section is really fun. Um, and we've all done it slightly differently, but I think they're very favorable. And I think conversations are building, build, building about um, how we can, how people, how the city can plant better uh, trees, you know, plant more trees, get more tree cover on roads um, like the Thika, Thika Highway. Uh, you know, there's a lot of places. I know that Kura, I was in a meeting online with Kura about whether we could do a tree seed project, tree, a tree project for Nairobi. And they have 750 kilometers of road in Nairobi. So of course, in a lot of those places, the road reserve has been built upon and there's no space for trees, but you could probably, we could probably work out how many trees those roads could involve, could absorb if we took like a third of 750 and then we worked out the spacing we could probably plant like maybe a hundred thousand trees or something like that, which would make a really big difference in Nairobi and provide a lot of employment for youth, right? And people working on it. Thanks, Joshua. Thank you very much, uh, Kathy. Uh, from uh, James Ngunjiri, he is asking, which are the best trees to plant in the city and around build environment? Mm. 
I guess it depends how much space you've got, right? Uh, but I think as a principle, indigenous trees, right? Yeah, like I would do indigenous trees. If, if it's really a very built environment, you might want to do not want to do a really big indigenous tree, but there are plenty of small Kenyan trees, a lot of which are flower are flowering trees. So um, you know, uh, I think we've got a choice. How many species of tree do we have in Kenya? Like six hundred or something? We have got such a fantastic choice. So um, this can only be like a fun thing, and it can only be if it's done right, right? And um, yeah, and, and so good for the nurseries, right? Because we can have a program with nurseries producing and gets per stuff gets purchased from them. I can only see multiple benefits from this. Um, but thanks for your question, James. Thank you. Uh, from Kennedy Mateka, just a general comment. We have often uh, seen trees decimated in a matter of minutes when they interfere with power lines in the city. Oh. I think we should involve Kenya Power and other stakeholders like Kenha, Kura, county government, I think, in addressing this problem in addition to helping them in species selection for planting in different parts of the city. Yeah, I think that's a really um, good question. And I wonder if you're a forester or somebody who's really like into this. I think involving Kenya Power is a really good idea. Involving Nairobi water, sewage and water, also really good because you don't want to bust a drain, right? You don't want to have some roots go into a drain or something. And at the same time, they know where their flood points are and trees are a help. Trees a bit higher up would diminish the floods. But I think you're right. And I think you know, um, trees are a very contentious thing all over the world. Like if you want to have an argument with your neighbor in America or London, like let your, a branch go into the neighbor's garden. And, you know, it, it, like I have a friend who's a tree officer in London and most of her time she has to spend calming neighbors down when they're like feuding over a tree, right? So, you know, inherently trees um, spark issues, but, um, I do think here, because people cook up fuel wood has value here. Like when I went down to take pictures of the trees being cut near the university in the CBD, near the playing grounds there, um, you could see that actually there was some excitement among the people who were cutting the trees about where the wood was going because it has value, right? So uh, I do think that like the um, power company, sometimes it's not just clearing for power and maybe the workers or the guy whose truck it is, have got an interest in what happens to the wood and they'd like to have possibly as much wood as they can. So um, I think probably the whole city tree thing just needs to get more organized and, and you have like arborists advising that this, this is a sick, sick tree, it really does need cutting or only this branch is, needs cutting because only this branch is diseased. And, and so on and so forth, right? So um, we need, we just need to take trees much more seriously because they give so many benefits, you know, mental health, less car accidents, uh, more physical activity, less diabetes, um, you know, you name it, yeah. But very good question. Thank you, Kennedy. Uh, thank you. Uh, from Maina, Karyuki, Maina Muryuki, excellent yes, work. Uh, Caleb Toroi Teach. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Okay. Question number one, what tree species without aggressive roots would you recommend for constricted street areas? And question number two, where is the place of shrubs and ground covers in the concept of urban forests? I see the definition is only about trees. Yeah, yeah. So let me take the, the, the roots one is a bit trickier for me. But um, you know, actually, pretty much the smaller the tree, the the you can pretty be pretty be you can be pretty sure the smaller the tree, the less problematic the roots are going to be, right? And palm trees, not um, don't plant those royal palms, those Cuban palms, right? They're exotic. They're really like we don't need those. There are some very nice indigenous palms you can plant. They wouldn't have much to do in in the way of roots, right? But I really, really agree with you about ground cover because what people love is the grass, right? They want to sit on the grass because it feels clean um, and it's a pleasure to sit on grass. And of course they want shade, right? 
but I really, really agree with you. And um, I think flowers have a big place. And we did plant a lot of agapanthus, several hundred agapanthus, you know, which is the, the one with the head with a, like a ball. And then it's like a lily or something. And you will all know it if, if it, you may not know the name for it. And it's actually a South African, it's an African, you can stretch it and say it's indigenous because it's from Southern Africa, right? So at least it's African, if not East African, if not Kenyan, right? And I really, really agree that ground cover and shrubs are super, super important. And flowers just make people happy. And I was really anti hibiscus in the beginning. And then I thought, why shouldn't people see bright red flowers, bright pink flowers? Why shouldn't people have more of a, of a gardened feel about where they're walking? And also I knew that because I was planting a lot of wild trees, it was probably smart underneath not to be very wild and to have nice mown grass, nice agapanthuses and nice hibiscuses. So you get a kind of like a contrast between the wild trees and then this manicured layer below. And I, it like works well, probably. In England, what you get a lot, what you get in Europe now and not just England and in America is wildflowers. Like they're just, because bee populations are collapsing, they plant like the wildflowers in, in you know, mixed seeds of wildflowers. And that's fun, but of course they have winter. We have planted a lot of sunflowers and people tweet about it because it's really fun to drive down there and see like a line of yellow flowers on both sides of the road. Um, but that's a temporary thing because it, it was while the earth wasn't covered with grass. And so we'll probably be doing a lot less of that. But I think you're right. Um, so ground cover, um, ground cover really important. Yeah, and grass. Great. Uh, from Jacobus Cohen, where are good tree nurse, where are good nurseries who produce indigenous trees? I know one in this area on the foot of Ngong Hills, but are there any nearer to town, Westlands? So I think if you know a bit about your indigenous trees, and my experience of most Kenyans is they do know, and they know their uses, the uses of them as well, right? Um, you can spot indigenous trees in like the standard nurseries on the side of the road if you kind of hunt around, but you wouldn't get them in big, in big numbers. If, if you want to do a planting project, um, Friends of Karura um, are raising a huge number of indigenous species and a large number of individuals of those species. And they, they will sometimes donate. We've managed to get donations for the Com Green in Corrigotro. And, um, and KFS has also got, um, that, got their nurseries. And um, Machuki Park is meant to be the nursery for the cities, for the city. Um, and then if you go to Brackenhurst, there's a botanical garden there and you can get um, quite a few very unusual species. You do have to pay for them. Um, and um, yeah, but we do need more. I mean, it, you know, if I could get a lot of money, I would run a program for city trees. And one of the things I would do is work with nurseries because the nurseries actually do a fantastic job. And the ladies I work with all work in a nursery. And um, they, they've got huge knowledge of plants. And I pretty much defer to their decisions about what works here, what doesn't work there, because they know much more, being much more experienced. But I would actually run a program um, with the nurseries and encourage the growing of indigenous trees and then try and generate a demand for them. Because the reason people don't grow indigenous trees is that um, there isn't much of a market for them they'll they'll raise them and then nobody wants them people want exotics of various descriptions right so i hope i hope i've answered um your question hey thank you from maina murioki how do you deal with the effects of the roots of the trees on the foundations of roads and buildings um i know this is a big worry and that's we were lucky in that the road the, there's the road, then there's a big drain, and then there's a sidewalk, and then there's the road reserve, right? So we, we were never planting right next to the road. We were also plant, always planting pretty far back, but that's not to say there might not be problems in the future. 
like one problem that could possibly arise is in the dry season, like the Meru Oak and the Cordia Africana do drop a lot of leaves. And, um, you know, at the moment we're sweeping them up and we're using them as mulch, right? But if that was being dropped actually on the road, you could see that that might be a problem. And right now it's kind of like falling on the road reserve and we just tidy it up for like uh, beauty reasons and tidiness reasons. But we were really, really careful to plant the magumos really far back from the road, right? So, the, you know, there's no way those, because I do know magumos can produce big uh, roots that can break things up. We similarly, uh, avocado came up as, a, fruit trees came up as an issue. And some people were saying to me, you should plant a food forest and have avocados and be feeding people. But all, there were two reasons I didn't do that. One is, or we didn't do that. One is I didn't want the avocados like falling on the road and like it being messy, right? Uh, I also didn't want children climbing the trees and getting hurt. And then because there are monkeys in this area still, um, uh, we, the people from Karura are saying, you're just gonna have dead monkeys on the road. You know, you're just gonna be attracting monkeys and you're gonna have um, squashed monkeys basically. There's gonna be injuries as a result. So we, we, we eventually did plant a few uh, avocados uh, because somebody gave me like a hundred seedlings, but we planted them way, way, way back. And then the interesting thing is they're very pal palatable to cattle and they were in all of them eaten. I don't think any of them survived. So I just, you know, we probably won't repeat that. Um, but have I gone off point there? Um, oh, root, roots, the road. Yeah. So yeah, you, you don't want to block vision. You don't want to damage the road. But I think that, and I wouldn't plant a ficus right up against a house because I think a fig tree, right, a bagumo right up against a house because you could probably get some damage. But there's lots of really good smaller trees that you can plant, yeah? Thank you for that. Uh, from Nuru, for it's about anything that will make our towns greener, I will support. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Thank you, Nuru. Great. Uh, Kennedy Mateka, Jacobus, uh, most, plant, most plant nurseries under the KFS stock indigenous species. Mm -hmm. I think that was a response mm -hmm. to that. Uh, Rafael Mirera, good presentation. How can one join the movement? I'm working on a research on urban forests in Nairobi. Well, are you doing, I wonder if he's doing a master's or something. I would love somebody to come and study our trees, for example. And I also, I, I want to say something else about that. Um, uh, I would really like to, if I was, could, there could be, I could clone myself. I would like to ask people what they think we're doing, right? And because people would stop and thank us a lot. And, um, uh, but, you know, trees are associated with crime. Um, people are scared of trees. I'm scared of, I'm scared of forests when I'm alone in a forest, right? Um, you know, it's murky, it's dark, it's a little bit sinister. And one of the things I really wanted was for the trees not to create hidden corners where women could be jumped out at, for example, if they're walking along. Like a lot of people will use this road to get from like Gishier to the CBD. So there's a lot of people walking it every single day. And I just wanted, when people sat under those trees, I wanted them to be able to see the cars, to be able to see other people, um, I know one of the reasons I, I've heard some good research in South Africa about one of the reasons people don't want too many trees in townships is they associate them with crime, people hiding, people running behind trees, that kind of stuff. So what I think would be a fabulous research project is to try and get people's perceptions of uh, trees in cities. That's a kind of sociological one. And then, of course, things like growth rates. Um, some people argue that we don't know the behavior of these trees very well and that we need to study them more. Um, and we, you know, we're taking forest trees or putting them in the city. Does that really work well? So I think there's so many, so many uh, good, good subjects. And uh, you could also send me an email or something. Um, you know, if people want to do master's degrees and stuff like that, I don't have any funding for them. But um, I think there's lots of ways to get involved or just form your own group. And I think, you know, it's not actually not that expensive to do it. And if you start planting in your neighborhood, uh, I think people would be, um, you know, really, really appreciative. 
that's great. Maybe at the end of uh, this talk, you will uh, share your contacts so that uh, whoever mm -hmm. would like to can uh, easily reach you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, from Margaret first, a uh, great work, especially if you can get more trees into the less affluent areas. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jacobus Cohen, I am living on Rafta Road and it is very disturbing how many trees are being cut down on the streets and inside compounds. It is hard not to become depressed about it. I feel quite helpless on what I can do. The electricity lines on every side of the road also seems to be holding people back to plant new trees. What's your take on that, Kathy? No, oh, I think it's really hard. Do you have a residence association? Um, those things can be really very, very upsetting. And in Uganda, I would hear, you know, I got to Uganda after Museveni had taken power and things were really bushy and there were really, really big trees. And then people started re renovating buildings and you would hear the sound of chainsaw and you would just think, oh no, here comes some great big mahogany or mavule is going to come crashing down. This is so upsetting. It was really, really bad and there was no regulation on it. Um, but it would be so good if, um, if you had a residence association, I can see you're saying you don't know if there is one, and, um, and maybe go see Kenya Power and talk to them about it. And um, because nobody's like officially anti-tree, everybody's kind of pro-tree uh, on, on the face of it. And um, it, is, it is really sad. And that's why we need some urban management, forest management plans like the Kampala plan says that every um, building has to have like a line of trees in front of it and a certain amount of land on a plot has to be, of course, whether, whether that's going to be enforced is, is another very, very difficult question. Um, but sorry, sorry for that. I can see it, it, it must be, Cohen, it must be really uh, upsetting. <laughs> it must be really upsetting. And I deal with my own upsetness by planting. Because I also get upset, you get upset about things, right? And um, there was a gentleman who was filling a, in, in filling a wetland near me. And I was very, very distraught about that. I tried to involve NEMA. Um, but, you know, these people, do they do it at night. You know, you can actually call a NEMA person out and they still, they still continue to do it. It's, um, it can be very, very discouraging. So try and take care of yourself as you go through this and uh, try and see if you can do something that can compensate and make you feel better, is what I would advise. Uh, thank you. From Otieno Kennedy, marvelous presentation, Kathy. I was late today, but next time I will make sure <laughs> to make it on time. Most welcome, Kennedy. Uh, from Naomi Chepi, impressive. Uh, thanks for the nice presentation, Kathy. Is it possible to share the presentation? Actually, maybe to answer Naomi on that, uh, this presentation is on record. And after this, we will upload it to our YouTube channel, Nature Kenya. So uh, you can uh, revisit it at any time you would wish. Uh, from Margaret Vass, how do we support training more youth into these jobs to support planting? Well, and actually what I was gonna say to you all is that I'm very contactable on Facebook. If you just type Kathy Watson, uh, Kathy Watson, and then just do Nairobi, I think I'm the only person with that name in town. And you'll just see it's a very tree-focused Facebook page. But what you'll also see is there are so many groups of um, young people in um, Kibera, of course, the Korogotro group, um, uh, Kam Kamkunji, there are so many young environmental activists who are leading groups and doing this kind of work. So you could become one of those activists or you could maybe join those activists. And a lot of them are planting trees. Um, a lot of them are trying to get uh, um, debris and garbage out of Nairobi River. There's a big effort to clean up rivers. And actually, if you look at those, somebody asked about um, the less favored areas of town. Along Nairobi River, there's actually quite a lot of, not everything is, in Kibera, it's like right up to the railway, right up to the rivers and stuff like that. But in a lot of these places, there seems to be quite a big gap before the river, um, which is good because it's usually flooding, so it wouldn't be too safe to build right there. 
but um, there's a lot of uh, efforts going to create parks and there's the People's Park in Corregocho, which is very famous and has won lots of awards. Um, and uh, then there's groups like Public Spaces Kenya, Daima, there's also Daima, D-A-I-M-A. -A. Uh, there are like various groups if you go on Twitter that there's a public space competition. There's quite a lot of buzz and there's architects and urban planners who are looking at these things. And I know that UN Habitat is in discussions with the Kenyan government and they want to try and create like linear parks along the rivers with cycle lanes and also like along the railway. And so there, are, there is thinking about it. And um, the big organizations like the World Bank, which give, you know, 150 million dollar loans to the Kenyan government to do urban development should get much greener and they should really, really involve these groups and they should really have strong green plans. Um, it's not sometimes not so impressive what they see as urban spaces. They're, they're really into building and concrete. And we know that's the worst, right? We know that's like exactly what we shouldn't really be doing a lot of right now. Um, we need to do things in a much more climate friendly kind of way and people friendly, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rupi Mangat, I am on Rafta Road too. Some old <laughs> trees that needed to be pruned were just cut by authorities. Easy way out. So how often should trees be pruned in urban areas? Yeah, that's why I think we need this category of people called arborists. You know, arbor is tree in Latin or whatever, or like in French, tree is arbre, right? So there's this type of category of people called arborists. You can actually, I think, even do the qualification online. Uh, it's not like a very huge qualification, and it's not a university qualification um, in England, for example, in the UK. And the Arborist Association in the UK is super, super active. And that's exactly what all those tree officers in London do. There's the London Tree Officers Association, LTOA. And I've given a talk to them as well. But I went out with one of them and you know, they're like checking like, is, are, are the roots doing this? Is this tree leaning a little bit like this? Look, this one has got a fungus. This one is actually fine. And, and you know, we actually, it's a whole, we worry about youth employment. We don't know what we're going to do with young people. It's a crime that they're not, they don't have jobs, right? And, um, the, you know, we could create hundreds and hundreds of green jobs. And I think it would be awesome to have uh, qualified arborists because you don't have arborists. They're not even foresters, Rupi, who are, who I think I know you, Rupi Manget, don't I? I think we're friends on Facebook. Um, uh, you don't even have foresters doing that, that you just have the strong guys with chainsaws or pangas or, or whatever, kicking those trees down. It's not like it's, so people are skilled as far as I can see. So they just want to remove it. It's not a very, they're not very discerning about is this tree diseased? Uh, if we remove too many branches, will the whole thing die? Will it become lopsided and, and start to fall. There's a lot of thinking that goes on, on with pruning. It's a whole thing, you know, just like being a doctor or a nurse. Uh, tree health is a whole thing. And I think it would be really nice if that were introduced in as a curriculum in Kenya and, uh, you know, at the tree colleges or at uh, practical colleges, you know, more like technical colleges uh, in, in Nairobi, because I don't think we're going to get good pruning until we have people with those that who have followed that curriculum. And of course, it needs to be done for tropical trees, right? Because the curriculum in England will be all about oaks and you know, co cold climate trees. So we need also to develop um, to develop that for, for the trees in Kenya. Okay, uh, from Peter Njeru, good presentation. Where do you see Nairobi open spaces in the next 30 years with the ongoing densification of settlements and uh, other deleterious developments? Yeah, I think you must have studied urban planning if you use a word like densification, right? That's, uh, that's a good word for what's happening. And of course, land, land prices are very, very, very high. And why would somebody have a house on a huge plot when you could build an apartment building and, and you know, um, if, if London didn't have zoning, right? If London and cities like that, it, they would also lose everything, right? And it's only because 
there are laws that are enforced. So, um, you know, you need the policies, you need the enforcement. And um, I just hope that, you know, you've got people dying in heat waves in North America and of course in the Middle East and things like that. And you know, this concept of the urban heat island, right? Which is that during the day, all this concrete and steel and everything absorbs heat, right? And then they emit it, right? So you get these much higher temperatures where of course trees reflect heat and cool in all sorts of ways, right? So, you know, urbanization is not gonna be healthy unless we can make it greener. And I guess we know what needs to be done, but then there's like whether you can actually pull it off. And, but you know, there's the very encouraging things like um, Majuki Park being restored, um, and um, city park being restored and if we can get really good tree planting and the other thing is you know schools tend to have a little bit of land S schools hospitals police posts wherever we can plant let's plant trees I think and and grass to follow up on that thing and ground you know ground cover and shrubs uh, thank you another question from uh, Chaco Pascoin Another question, is there a tree that one could plant that has root that goes down rather than one? <laughs> oh, I'm really sorry about this. Um, there must be somebody who can answer your, your root questions. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've planted so many trees and none of the houses I've lived in in the last 35 years in Africa have got damaged by trees. Um, I could say that it's like um, you're worrying too much but probably you've seen very bad cases. Um, I think that trees, um, you know, they like to go, I think you get a circle of roots under a tree, don't you? And, but you can do things like cut the roots on the side of the house, right? So the, the side of the tree that faces your house, you can cut the roots there. You can go down, dig, cut those roots and it will be nourished from the, the so, the, you know, and other people put like a, a, a layer of concrete or something so the roots can't go there. Um, so I just think you have to choose smaller trees. Uh, that's also another thing to do. Cause you know, it kind of, what's underground kind of reflects what's above ground, right? So, um, yeah, the bigger the tree, the bigger the roots effectively. But a lot of the exotics that are planted have bad roots as well. Like, you know, that, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, so it's not like it's just indigenous trees that have that problem. A lot of them have that problem, yeah. Um, which way are you heading? Okay. No, okay. Kathy, can you hear us? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, uh, from Maina Murioki, where can one get expert advice on tree options? Um, well, one thing I could say to you is there's a very, very good tree book that you can download for free onto your computer, onto your laptop. It's called The Useful Trees and Shrubs of Kenya. And they will tell you a lot about each tree that you could possibly encounter, right? So that's, you don't even have to spend any money. It just takes up space on your computer. It's a really, really, really useful tree book. And um, useful trees and shrubs of Kenya. Um, I think, you know, you try KFS, try the, um, you know, try some of the nursery people. Uh, they can, um, they can help. And maybe we need to form a, a tree group or something to provide advice to each other. Because to be honest, you know, I don't know that some of the trees we've planted have been much planted in urban settings. And of course the bypass, is not a really very urban setting. It doesn't have buildings along the edge of it. It's just like land. Um, so so um, there's a lot of learning. So maybe you could try and learn. <laughs> That's another thing, you know, uh, uh, learn by doing, yeah. Okay, nice. Uh, about uh, the publication that uh, you mentioned, maybe also to add on top is that uh, we have it in our Nature Kenya shop. Maybe if uh, it's in need of, uh, you can just walk into the Nature Kenya membership office. We have uh, the useful trees and shrubs oh, for Kenya, okay. the yeah. technical handbook. 
number yeah. 35. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, from Peter and Jeru, the talk has come to an end to an appropriate time where Nairobi County has called for public participation on Nairobi City County Public Open Spaces Use and Maintenance oh. Bill 2021 and submission oh. of memoranda by 29th September 2021. Oh, where, where was that average? Was that in the newspaper? <laughs> where was that call? Okay, maybe uh, Peter and Jeru will uh, ah, drop us. it in the chat box, more info yeah. about that, or also maybe share a link yeah. on where we can uh, yeah. get more information about it. Yeah, there's the East African Herbarium. That's what I'm saying. I think Museums of Kenya, all those people in there are a huge resource. Yeah, they, I'm sure they can advise. Great, thank you. Uh, from Rupi Manga, Indigenous Trees, what's Indigenous in Taita or elsewhere in the country is not indigenous in yeah. other parts of the country. Mm. That's, that's very true. And that's why I said we, we knew that this area was dry upland montane forest, right? So we weren't going to plant something that grows really well, like in Pakot area here. Nairobi is very high. You know, it's, it's really high. It's 5,000 meters or whatever, um, 5,000 feet. That, that's high, that's really high. Great. Uh, Rafael Mirera, yes, I am doing a master's. So it's actually a response of uh, the earlier Very discussion. Nice. So maybe you will uh, share the, your contacts and I, he can keep in touch. Yeah. Facebook, uh, that's the place. Kathy Watson, <laughs> Facebook, no problem. I'll, I'll accept, I accept lots of people there just to talk about trees. Oh, okay, that's fine. Uh, James Mwenjiri, is it possible to have Kenna plant trees along the road? This could go a long way in achieving uh, carbon sequestration. Yeah. yeah, I think we really need, you know, I just drive, I drive, you know, you go out of town, past Mithega, towards the and you just think, oh, there's so many places we could be planting there. And it, it's kind of, um, I get like a yearning, we could make this place really, really good, and it would be safe for traffic and for people does multiple, multiple wins. I think we do need to get, have more of a consultation with Kura and Kenya and the power company, like somebody said, water company, um, Nairobi Metropolitan Services, KFS. Um, there's, there's actually a lot of uh, really thought out organizations and people, right? Even if sometimes, you know, Kenya power cuts too much and that kind of thing. Right. Uh from Rafael Murera, thank you. I'll send you an email. And uh, Chakobas Cohen, I don't know if there is a residence association in Rafter Road. Oh. Uh -huh. Dave Hilliard, this is a wonderful, this is a wonderful inspirational presentation. Thank you very much. I currently live in England, but in a few years, I will retire from work and I will very much like to become involved in conservation and tree planting in Kenya. What would you recommend, please? Oh, I would recommend, you know, Nature Kenya, East African Wildlife Society, like go see, go see the people at the herbarium, go to the Arboretum, there's lots of experts there. You can, you'll find your slot, don't, don't worry, you will find something really good to get involved in. Even if it's just the area where you live in and there's some schools, um, it's not so much money. You know, sometimes I think, oh, I'm spending a lot of money on the bypass, but we all know about art cafe, right? Or Java, you can spend 2000 shillings sometimes when you go to those places that can buy a lot of trees, right? They're not so expensive trees. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So I think also Dev uh, can get in touch with us here in Nature Kenya, then yeah. uh, we can interact more on that. Uh, Barbara Ogori, excellent presentation. Thank you for this insightful talk. Elias Miner, thanks Kathy for the wonderful presentation. Uh, Jacobus Cohen, it, it is just that people seem to worry about it. Uh, yeah. Kennedy Mateka, Jacobus, most trees in the legume family, Fabaci, have tap roots, main roots, which tend to go down rather than spread. Thank you. Please visit East Africa Herbarium at the National Museums of Kenya for advice on indigenous or native species. Also follow us on Twitter at East Africa EA Herbarium underscore NMK. James Kipto, 
thank you very much. Where can I find orchids to plant? Okay, that one we know that um, that one we know there's a Kenya Orchid Society, right? And they have amazing, they had an amazing show that was pretty much free at the Sarat Center. And they're really crazy people who love orchids. You can't believe their displays. And uh, yeah, I think there's uh, quite a lot of places you can get orchids. Yeah, the quick question is, do you want African orchids or do you want um, these ones from Thailand and everything like that? But one of the things that really impressed me about the Kenyan Orchid Society is that they do like outreach work to tell people if, you know, because or Kenyan orchids just grow naturally on their trees, that if one falls off, you should put it back up there, that these are things that are important for biodiversity. And I thought that was like a very cool, it's not all about just having a nice pot plant in your house, right? It's also about orchids in their in their ecosystems, which I thought was great. Hey, uh, from Vivian, very enlightening talk. Glad to have found out who has been behind the trip, uh, the planting of trees alongside many Nairobi roads. Yeah. That is here. <laughs> and I'm going to take, I've just taken Peter and Jeru's just posted the details. Um, I'll, I'll check and see if I can find it online. About yeah, Peter Jeru has uh, posted that uh, call for submission of memoranda of Nairobi County public open spaces use and maintenance bill 2021 in Daily Nation of 22nd September 2021, page 12. Deadline for submission is 29th of September. Dave Hilliard, thank you, Kathy, for your advice. Uh, Florence Cipala, also when you plant trees, consider fruit trees. Let us incorporate edible landscaping as we plant trees in urban areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. I think um, we've been able to go through all the concerns in, uh, in the chat box and uh, thank you very much, uh, Kathy, for uh, perfectly and uh, promptly attending to all of them. So uh, thank you very much, each and every one of you for your uh, participation, uh, participation all the way long since we started. Up to now, we have uh, come to an end. I still uh, make an announcement for the invited guests that uh, you are welcome to join our Nature Kenya membership. We really, really welcome you. And uh, for the members, also to make an announcement that uh, our Wednesday bird walks and uh, Sunday bird watch are still on. And next week on Wednesday, we are here at the Nairobi National Museum and Michuki Memorial Park. We are meeting at 8 a.m. in the morning. And uh, we are also uh, planning uh, the program for next month, that is in October, which will be communicated in our NatureNet newsletter, which will be released uh, next week at the course of the month. So uh, thank you very much and uh, have a lovely weekend ahead. Thanks very much for having me. You're most welcome. So uh, we can leave at our own pleasure, but uh, Kathy, you can still remain behind. Thanks. But if anybody sees me on the bypass, do stop and say hi, right? If there's a way you can park there at the top of the Pony Road and people often stop or they give us a plant or something. It's we're really open to chatting to people and we can walk you around and show you a few things. <laughs>